Thank you, Jesus. Today, we are going to look at knowing the God we worship. We are starting a brand new series. I believe that is going to change the way we worship, the way we approach God. It's going to change our relationship with God in a very deep way. This series is a continuation of our series on discipleship. Just stay with me. Discipleship. And we finish our discipleship and we are going to go into the next step in our walk with God, growing in Him. Let me take this opportunity to welcome all those that are here today. Let's give them a hand, everybody. Give a hand. We also want to welcome those that are joining us by radio, television in our churches in Victoria and also in Ghana. Welcome. Welcome to our first service. Amen. Now, this is what we have done so far in the last five or six weeks. We began by talking about who is a disciple. We talk about who is a disciple, and we talk about a disciple is a follower, a disciple is a fruit bearer, and a disciple is a fisher. You remember that? God is called out to disciple all nations, and that's going to be our theme in the next 25 years. I didn't get an amen. amen. Then we talk about the making of a disciple. What does it entail for us to be disciples of God? We talk about prayer, the word, fellowship. In Acts chapter 2, if you recall, then we talked about the cost of discipleship. Discipleship comes with a price. Jesus said, if anybody wants to come after me, let him do what? Carry his own cross and deny himself and follow me. Then we also talk about one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And we talk about the power of one, why it is important to find somebody to disciple you. Or be, you'll be discipling somebody at any moment in your Christian life. Somebody should be discipling you and you should be discipling somebody. And the question that you need to be asking is, who is my disciple and who is my discipler? Every one of you, at every point in our journey, we need to have somebody speaking into our lives or we are speaking into the life of others. Are you still following me? Then we spoke about small groups. Small group is where true discipleship takes place in the sense that that is where we connect to people. People may ask, ah, I don't know. How do I find a disciple? How do I find a disciple? How do I find... Get into a small group. Get into our group groups. Get connected. And God will bring people into your life. And I want you to start praying. Church, I want you to start... What happened? You, you go to sleep. Come with me. Come with me. Somebody should be praying for him. <laughs> where, where was I? Okay. So, you, you, small groups, get connected. Every child of God should be part of a small group. We also said God himself dwells in small group, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he said, let us. The, the, the let us is very important for every growth in your life. The let us is important in your transformation process as a child of God. Are you still following me? So get connected. Get to know people. Get to know people that you can connect with, people that can speak into your life. Then we also remember we talk about the stages of growth. Um, and um, Jonathan led us through that stages and you, you need to know where am I as a disciple of Christ and today I want to take off from there in our next series the stages of growth let, let, let me begin by reading first John I believe that this is what Jonathan read he said I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven I <laughs> for, for his name's sake I write to you fathers because you have known him then he says, who is from the beginning? I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Now, these are the stages um, of discipleship. I write to you, children. I write to you, young men. And I write to you, fathers. Fathers, that is the highest level of our spiritual journey. It's I write to you, fathers, because you have what? Known him. Knowing God is as deep as it goes as a disciple. That's the level that every one of us need to get to. So the next six or eight weeks, we're going to talk about how do we know God? How do we encounter him? Do we really know him? So today I'm going to bring you seven aspects of the importance of knowing God. Why this is so important in our discipleship process, in our growth. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so let's start with the first one. The first one is obviously praise. Now, we cannot worship God, praise God that we don't know. It's very important. That's why it's important that you know this God that you're worshiping. If you don't know him, you can't worship him. If you don't know your wife, 
you can't please her. If you don't know your husband, you can't please him. You got to know what he likes. Um, they call it what? Five what? Love language. love language. You got to know people and know their love language so that you can actually serve them and be a, a blessing to them. Do, do you know the love language of your spouse? Yes. Don't, uh, uh, you are trying. God, God help you on that. <laughs> Worshiping God. John chapter 4 verse 22. Very cr critical passage. Now Jesus is dealing with this woman about worship about how to worship, how to connect. And he, he says something very profound. He said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. That's the problem. You cannot worship what you do not know. You think you are worshiping God, but you are worshiping idols. And that is why it is important to know the God you worship. Because if you don't know, you may be worshiping something else. He said, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. You have to worship what you know. You can't say that God is almighty, is everlasting. God is my healer when you haven't experienced him. You can't. Otherwise, it's just mere words. That what we see in worship, like with David, what we see in worship with, with, with Jacob and Jehovah Shammah. Why would you say Jehovah Shammah? Because God's presence has been so real to him. You can't say Jehovah Shammah until you have experienced that presence. You can't say Jehovah Shalom. You can't worship Shalom if, if, if you haven't experienced his peace. So you got to know this God of peace. So when you worship the, the God of peace, you know what you're talking about. Are you, are you still following me? He said, you Samaritan worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation of the Jews. Yet a time is coming. Now this is going to make available to everybody. And now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. You see, once you get to know God, you realize that you have to connect with God at a certain level. You see, you are natural, but God is not natural. You, you, you are finer, but God is not finer. So when, when, when I speak to you, I speak to you as a human being. We connect. I talk to your language, and you understand me as a human being. But when you come to worship God, it changes because God is a spirit. And so your, 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 your physical nature cannot connect with God. Your spirit has to connect with God. So when you don't understand that, that is why our fathers worship idols because they need something they can touch, they can feel, and they, 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 they can relate to in a physical way. No, 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 no. When you know God as a spirit, you worship him in spirit. So you have to understand your God is a spirit. The, the, the point at which we connect with God is at a spiritual deep level. Not only that you worship God in spirit, you also have to worship God in truth. In other words, you have to worship what you know. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourself. Worship what you know for, for he said, for the father is looking for this kind of worshipers. The worshipers seek him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Wow. So you have to encounter this God of the spirit and God of truth. It is so important that we know how to worship this God. Because why, I want to write this down. If you don't know how to worship God, you will create your own God. You can create your own God. Look around us in North America. We have created our own gods, and we think this is God. Let me tell you something. In the Old Testament, God will never ask you to worship him until he has revealed himself to you. Right. Never will God ask anybody to worship until he has revealed himself. So li listen to this. He brings Israel out of the promised land through the Red Sea, out of Egypt into the promised land through the Red Sea. And he tells Moses, listen, I want you to come upstairs. I want to reveal myself to you and show these children how to worship me. So Moses goes to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Why? Because worship hasn't started yet. Israel don't know this God, so they can't worship him. So he goes up there and he reveals himself. The tabernacles, how they should approach him, the holiness of holy, how, what they should wear, how to sanctify themselves, and all that. God is showing himself so they can reveal him. You can worship God until he reveals himself. That is why you got to know him. Amen. But meanwhile... The children of Israel got a bit impatient and they said to Aaron, we don't know what has really happened to this Moses, so make us a God that will go before us. That's what I'm saying. When you don't know this God, you can create your own God. So, 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 so Aaron said, okay, bring your earrings and, and the, the, he, he, he made a golden calf and he said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt. And the Bible said they began to dance and worship. They thought they were worshiping God. That's right. 
In fact, the Bible says they brought peace offerings and fellowship offerings. But they were off. This is your God that brought you out of Egypt, this golden calf. This golden calf did not do the miracles in Egypt. This golden calf did not divide the Red Sea. This golden calf did not come with a strong hand to speak to Pharaoh. But they were deceived. And it's very easy to create your own God and you think this is God because you haven't met him. Sometimes the person that we think we are worshipping is not the true God. And so sometimes when God revealed himself to us, we are like, what then have I been worshipping? You've created your own God. If you don't learn to know God, you create your own God. And secondly, you will cling to foreign gods. You will be attracted to other gods. That's the second thing I want you to write down. Very dangerous. Because you don't know God, anybody can come to you. Any prophet can come to you. Any, and that's what is happening in North America. We're able to absorb all kinds of religions, every kind, because we don't know God. Anybody that say, hey, we worship. We cling to foreign gods. That is why when you know God and somebody comes to you and introduces you to another God, you may be able to say, no, 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 this is not a God that I know. Because when you have encountered the real, the genuine, when you see counterfeit, I was told that those who work at the bank, they, they are not actually exposed to counterfeit currency. They are exposed to genuine currency as part of their training. They expose them to genuine currency over and over and again. And when they see a false currency, they can tell. Amen. God wants to expose himself to you, the truth, the truth, the truth, that when you come against anything that is false, that is off, you can know. Are you still following me? Amen. Let me show you something in Judges. After that whole generation passed away, gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who did not, who knew neither the law nor what had done for Israel. Then you, you can smell trouble. When people don't know God, they have encountered God. What did they do? They worship foreign gods. Then Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and saved vows. They forsook the Lord, the God of the ancestors who have brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. Why? Because they do not know God. And that is why he said, I write to you fathers as disciples because you have known him. When you know God, have encountered God, no demon in hell. Come hell or high water, when they confront you, you say, I know whom I have believed. Amen. Number two. Why is it important to know God? Number two, because of priorities. When you get to know God, he changes your priorities. So what are you talking about, pastor? Let me show you in a second. Philippians 3, 8. This is Paul. He said, yes, everything else is worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He said, for his sake, I have disgusted everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. When you get to know God, it changes everything. It changes the way you look at life, changes the way you look at relationships, it changes the way you look at material things. It changes your view of life. Your world becomes upside down. Paul said, I count everything garbage for the excellency of knowing God. Once you begin to know God, every other thing becomes secondary. Why are we running after rubbish? Why are we running after material things? Why are we so focused on these things? Because we don't know God. Once you begin to know God, these things don't stress you anymore because they are number two or three on your list. Why are you quiet? This is what the Bible says in Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength. In other words, it changes your priorities. It's no more about wisdom, your, intelli your intelligence. It's no more about your strength. No, do not learn both about riches, not about material things. This has become secondary. But let the one who boasts, boast about this. Your priorities have what? Change. That they know that they have the understanding to know me and that I am the Lord 
If you want to boast, boast about knowing God. What does it mean to know God? Who is this God? One, that God exercises. Have you met the, the, the God of kindness? Boast that you know the God of justice. Boast that you know the God of righteousness. No, no, I get to know him as a loving God, as a justice God, as a righteous God. That's what you must boast about. When you rise up in the morning as a disciple of Christ, you must say, I know God. You must be able to say, as a, as a child of God, when you are going through certain situations, you must be able to say, I know my Redeemer lives. It changes the way you praise God. It changes the way you worship God. It changes your priorities. Are you still with me or you want me to stay here, bed? Or can I continue? <sighs> changes your purpose. I always say that knowledge, knowledge leads to purpose. You cannot know your purpose until you know your God. And God never revealed his purpose to anyone until he has revealed himself to, to them first and foremost. That's right. I'm going to show you in a bit. Oh, yeah. How do you run and fulfill his purpose when you don't know him? Right. When you don't know him, how do you fulfill you, you, his assignment, his plan for your life? So instead of first of all wanting to, God, where do you want to send me? You must first and foremost ask the question, who are you, Lord? Yes. Is that not what Paul said? You must always ask the first question. It's about knowledge. It's about revelation. It says, who are you, Lord? And what will you have me to do? What you have me to do comes after knowledge. In other words, reveal yourself to me and then tell me what you want me to do. Moses said, when I go to the people and they say, who sent you? What should I tell him? I know I have an assignment, but where do I am I going? So when God met Moses on, on, the, on the burning bush, he never told him anything about Egypt until he revealed himself to them to him. He said to him, take off your shoes. And then the next thing he said, I'm the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said something very profound. He said, by my name almighty, did they know me, but they never know me as the God Jehovah. In other words, Abraham knew me, but Abraham knew me at a certain level. But to you, I'm going to reveal myself at a certain level. You are going to see the aspect of Jehovah. Abraham only knew Almighty God. He never, know, never knew Jehovah. You are going to know Jehovah Rapha. Yeah. You're going to know the God who will heal your diseases. You are going to know yeah. Jehovah Jireh, the God that will make provision for you. Jehovah Zeknu, the God who is your righteousness. Yeah. When the enemy brings accusation about concerning your sin and shame, talk about Jehovah Zeknu. He is my righteousness. Yeah. Jehovah Shammah, who says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Lo, I am with you always. He said, you are going to see my power, my glory, that, hey, you know why? Because you have to know that aspect of me because it goes with the assignment. You have to know me as Jehovah because I am mighty to save. I am mighty to deliver. I am mighty to heal. I am mighty to go before you. He said, Moses, let me reveal myself to you so that when you go to Pharaoh, you know what you're talking about. I said, knowledge comes before purpose. You want to know your purpose first and foremost, get to know God. Okay, let me show you in Ephesians. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, remember, take note, I keep asking that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want God to open your eyes. Now this is Paul writing to the, the church in Ephesus. So that you may know him better. Better. You see, this is why I pray for wisdom and revelation. I want you to know him better. This is the height of your spiritual growth as a disciple of Christ. Do you know God? You see, Job, Job thought that he knew God. He was worshiping God until he encountered something. And he declared, I have heard with the hearing of my ear. Now my eyes have seen the Lord. The depths of the knowledge of God. Even Paul, towards the end of his life, declared that I might know him. That's the ultimate child of God. It's not about putting food on the table and get me a wife or a husband. It's about the excellency of knowing God. Amen. Because when you get to know God, everything else will follow. Amen. 
Oh yeah, you will fight your battles. The provisions will come. You will go and conquer your enemies. Yes, your purpose will come. When you know God, it changes everything. I write to you fathers because you know him. Pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order what you may know the hope which he has called you. Paul I pray that you catch a revelation. Your eyes will open that you know him better and then you understand your calling. Amen. Knowledge comes before calling, before purpose. You got to know him. And you got to know him in a very deep way. Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am the one whom you persecuted. Jesus introduces himself. He said, you can't, kick, you can't kick against the gods. And begin to talk to him about himself. Then he tells him his purpose. Amen. Are you serving a God that you don't know? Take time to get to know him. You say, pastor, but Amen. how do I know this God? It's a manual. He's revealed himself here. Amen. You read it like, oh, ah, this is the God I serve. Sarah, oh, where did all these years prayed and prayed, almost forgot about it, and God said, come true. Oh, this is the God I serve. This woman had the issue of blood for 12 years, spent all, for, forgot about everything. Jesus came through at the last hour. Oh, this is the God I serve. Why? So that when you are carrying an issue for 12 years, you know the God that came through. If you spend half of the time you spend on Facebook, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm, I'm not going there. I don't want to be stoned. I'm, I'm wearing my nice 25th anniversary t-shirt. I don't want people to throw eggs on there. I like it. By the way, have you gotten your t-shirt? You better get it because... Everybody, I'm going to encourage everybody to wear this on Friday, next Friday, all right? Amen? It's only $10. If you don't have money, come and see me. I'll buy you one, all right? Everybody. We talk about purpose. It is important to know God to understand purpose. Because purpose is important. It's, it, it directs your life. It, it directs your choices. I always tell people who want to get married, I always say what? Get to know your purpose first. Because otherwise you'll marry the wrong person. He may, be the, he, may, he may be the most gentle human being on earth, but if it's not meant for you, it will bring you hell. Amen. And there's nothing wrong with the young man. It's, the problem is not him. Purpose. You see, the issue was in Leah to Jacob. Leah was a beautiful girl. It was in Leah. But purpose... Jacob said, I have a purpose, I understand it. God has spoken to me, and it's not with Leah, it's with Rachel. So if, if, even if I have to wait 14 years, I don't mind waiting. See, purpose will decide for you. Purpose will make you wait. I know where I'm going. I, she's beautiful, but uh, she's not part of my purpose. Purpose decides where you lead. Purpose decides where you... It changes everything. Get to know God. And obviously, you, you, you've heard me say this. When you're not working with purpose, you'll be frustrated. You'll feel unfulfilled. You always sense something is missing. And when you are frustrated, anybody around you gets frustrated. It's like a fish on the sand. The fish doesn't belong there. Fish belong to the water. And you are out of, out of purpose. Get to know God. I pray that in the next few weeks, your eyes will be open and you, 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 can, you encounter this living God as you grow in your discipleship with Christ. Amen. Purpose. Let me give you the fourth one. Why is it important to know God? Purity. When you get to know God, it changes the way you live. Oh, yeah. Amen. I don't know about anybody that, that, that have encountered God and still living in sin. You can't. You can never live the old way. Something has to shift. Amen. That's right. Isaiah met God and whoa, 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 whoa. 
His life was never been the same. He said, woe is me, I am I'm undone. Um, I live among people of unclean lips. And he brought a coat and touched his lips. When people encounter, we are going to talk about knowing the Holy God. What, what does God's holiness entail? And when we encounter his holiness. In fact, when you meet God, the first sense you have is about his holiness. holiness. The beauty of his holiness. That's right. Everybody that has met God, the first thing they see is just, the guy is clean. Just pure. And that purity will confront the darkness, will confront the sin in your life and, 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 and the demonic influences and you begin to, sh it's almost like a light that shines through you. Are you still with me? Yeah. This is just introduction. We're going to go deeper in the next few weeks. Purity. Watch this. First John. Now by this, we know that we know him. That's, it's very simple. It's very easy. How do we know we know God? If we keep his commandments. Ouch. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. When you say you know God and you do not keep his commandment, you are deceiving yourself. The truth is not in you. Why? Because when you encounter God, something in you will shift. There's no way you meet God, encounter God, and still live the same. It's just impossible. And the closer you come to God, the more you know that you are nothing. The more you know how sinful you are. If when you meet people who are proud, they think they are holy, hip, hip, behaving like Pharisees, they haven't met God. Because I'm telling you, when you meet God, you'll be humbled. You'll go, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. The man said that that man wasn't able to come very close to him. He said, Lord, beating his chest, be, be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's what happens. The, the more you come close to God, the more you get exposed. You know, some, somebody was telling me the other day, they said, Pastor, you know, I had this issue with lust, and I've, finally I've got it under control, and now God is telling me I have to deal with lies. I said, there's more. Oh, can I get a witness? Amen. You think in the name of Jesus I overcome. I am a child of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've overcome. And God said, next. <laughs> in fact, God has even gotten to the deeper ones yet. Amen. He's dealing with He's dealing with the soft one, the soft spots. And sometimes it can be very frustrating. Because you are getting to know God deeper, and the more you get to know God, the more you get your soul get exposed. It is called transformation. Because as you come before God, as you are exposed to the beauty of God, the purity of God, the, the, the power of God, the presence of God, you get exposed. Even Peter Ted told Jesus, leave me. Jesus, just get away from me. He just saw some aspect of God and he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle it. So when you meet people who are proud and self-righteous, they haven't met God. Because when you meet, the more you meet God, the more you realize that you're a sinner. I mean, Job, the Bible began the passage by saying he was a perfect man. And yet when he met God, he said, Woe is me. Isaiah was a prophet when he encountered the holiness of God. He said, I saw the Lord. And I saw his train fill the temple. I saw his glory and I shouted, Woe is me. When you encounter God, and that is why I want to expose to you in the next few weeks, just getting to know this God. Sometimes you are worshiping and you are praying and you are, you are just ministering to God. You are seeking God and God is bringing your spirit to another level and you are encountering him. And sometimes you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody was telling me the other day, they said, Pastor Sam, I, was, I, I got scared. I, I, I entered into a zone and I was scared. I said, don't worry, God will change your garment. The same God who brings you into his presence will take the dirty garment and put on a new garment for you. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. He's the one that, is, that, that invites you to approach. He knows you are dirty. He knows you are impure. Right. You know, but we are changed from glory to glory. Amen. You know, knowing God produces a sense of purity. As you get to know him, as you get to expose to him, you realize, wow. 
Are you still with me? Let me give you number five. Knowing God also produces power. This is why it is important to know God. You see, when, when you know God, you get some inner strength, some boldness. You become emboldened because you know the God that you serve. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people, Mandukati Brondo Sabaya, the people who do know their God, It doesn't matter what you may go through. It doesn't matter what the enemy may throw at you. When you know God, you can say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. See, when I see people begin to frazzle and give up and they stop going to church because they are going through a little storm, they haven't met God yet. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I told you that I'm going to have uh, three triplets. I'm going to call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My wife doesn't agree with me, but I'm going there. I'm going to have triplets. I just, I just, I just love the name. It, it just feels good to, to, to come home and say, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, where are you? It just feels good. Can, 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 can I get a witness? It just feels good. So somebody pray for my wife that she will, she will let go. Pray that she will know God and release. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They say you have to bow to your God. I have seen Christians, I've even seen bishops, I've seen men of God, a little try, they give up. They compromise. He said you have to bow to this God, otherwise there's fire, you are going to die. He said, oh king, we are not careful to give you an answer. This is a people that know God. So we are not careful. Our God will deliver us. I know this aspect of God. He's a deliverer. He is mighty to save. He will take me out of trouble. He will put my feet. I know this God. But his understanding of God is not one-sided. Some of us, our theology is just suspect. Especially in Africa where I come from. Many of us only know God as a strong God, as a deliverer. But what about if he doesn't come through? Because God always doesn't come through. But he's still God. You know about the Jehovah Jireh. You know about the Jehovah Rapha. The mighty God. What about the sovereign God? Sometimes God does whatever he pleases. What about if God doesn't heal that disease on time? What about if God doesn't deliver or raise that dead that you will pray for? What about if God doesn't put that food on the table? Do you still not know that God? He said, our God will deliver us. But even if, you got to have an even if in your theology. Because sometimes God does not work according to your timing. You see, every one of us, we need a balanced theology. Amen. What about that sick person? I talked to a man of God back in my country. He has a disabled child. Nobody, nobody in the country knows that he has a disabled child. He just confided in us, me and my wife. He said, the church can't know this. The country can't know this. Because it doesn't square with our theology. People will say, God has left me. People will say, what is wrong with you? People will say all kinds of things. So this child has grown up. They never brought this child to church. What kind of nonsense is this? You got to have the even if. The God that brought you out of a pit can sometimes leave you in the pit. I am telling you, God left Joseph in the pit for more than 17 years. Locked the door and threw the key away, but he was still God. What about when it seems like God has forgotten you? God can deliver you out of prison. But there are people that God never delivered out of prison. Amongst all of them is Paul the apostle who died in prison. But Paul has come out from prison before. It's not that God is not able. Look, let me tell you something. John the apostle. God, Jesus loved him more than any of the twelve. He went into the island of Patmos. He died there. 
Do you hear people preaching about that? He died there. God did not bring him out. He died in prison. I am talking about even if. I am very comfortable with my theology. I believe God can deliver. I have seen God raise the dead. I have seen God heal the sick. But sometimes we don't know. And I'm comfortable with that. I have had a stillborn child in my arms in a hospital and the wife is saying, Pastor Sam, where is God? Where is God? I carry this for nine months and, I, I, and the child is born dead. I say, I don't know. I don't have to know everything about God. I worship a sovereign God. There are some things when I get to heaven. Look, I have had three children. I've also had some miscarriages in my life. I can tell you that. Where we went to the doctor's office and the doctor said, I'm sorry, mom, you have to, you are miscarriage and we have to, just like that, we have to st- just scrape you up and come back. Just like that. Just like that. But I'm comfortable with that. That's why you got to know God. I've seen people who have left the faith because their theology and their experience, what, there was a disconnect. I'm going to talk about the, the sovereign God in the next few weeks. Amen. Everything may fall apart, but he's still God. Amen. Your children may pass away. I'm ready for that. Amen. Wake up one morning, your three children are dead, but he's still God. Amen. When we were in Kenya at the Bible school, there was a young prophet in the city. Was a, some of you come from Kenya, you know Prophet Murima. How many of you know I'm talking about? Those of you from Kenya. He was a man of God. He was a young man at that time. And God was using him, but his theology was a bit suspect. I, be, I, I, I was at second year with Pastor Chris at Bible College, and we, we could hear him preach. You know, at that time, Kenya has the highest um, accident death at that time. And he used to preach and say, as a child of God, you can die before a certain age. How dare you? How dare you? Even Jesus died at 33 years old. Yes, he promises long life. If you are 80 years, 90 years, praise God. It doesn't mean all of us are going to be 80 years. Some of you will die at 50, die at 40. Not because God has for, for, forsaken you. Because the Bible says he determined, asked after 17, when you are born, where you die, he determined your days. This man of God died such a horrible death. Such a horrible death that his body, even his own wife, could not identify him in a car accident. The church was in shock because he has been preaching that a child of God cannot die this way. So they refused to bury him. They brought his remains to church and for five days they started to pray that God will raise him up. It wasn't that there were no faith in that place until the, the body was beginning to stink and the government had to step in. Now this is a true story. It happened in 1991. 1991. The government had to step in and shut down the church and bury the body. Because what they have been hearing and the reality did not match. We got to know God because some of us, we just know one side God. I know when we're growing up, we, we, we bought into the, the faith movement. And you, you, child of God, you can't get sick. When you are sick, that means that you are sinning. Blah, blah, blah. Don't go to the hospital. Don't. You've got to balance things up. Yeah. There's some things about God I don't know. Some of you know. The other day, a few. Anyway, you know. We, there was a ministry in the church. And God wanted to heal people with eyesight. I mean, and God touched somebody. All of a sudden, he could see. I spoke that word. I'm still wearing my glasses. <laughs> and don't tell me I didn't believe. I brought the word. That God wants to heal somebody's high sight. And immediately, he wore his glasses and it was blare. Why is it blare? He took the glasses off. It was clear. He said, Pastor, God healed. I went home saying... I actually did that because I felt the anointing where I put the glasses down, touched my eyes. It was still blurred. <laughs> and I decided God is still God. Even if. 
The Bible says Elisha died of his sickness. This is a man who could raise the dead. And yet God couldn't touch him. It wasn't that there wasn't enough power to touch him. The sovereignty of God. Fast forward many years later, he was dead. His bones were rotting. They threw a dead body into his bones and the dead person came to life. Amen. Go figure. The man who died, there was, a, there was enough power in the bones to raise the dead, but couldn't heal his own sickness. You got to know God. And the apostles understood that. So they marched to their death and they were killed upside down. They understood that, that God is sovereign. And I, I don't understand everything about God. He's a powerful God. He's a mighty God. I will trust him. I will believe him for mighty things. But when he doesn't do it, I know he's still God. Amen. 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 Am I saying something? Why do we need to know God? We'll come to that. Like I said, in a few, we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God. A child of God must also need to understand both when God puts on the table and when God does not. When God takes you to the value of the shadow of death, you know that you're going to come out. But even if you don't come out, you'll still serve him. Amen. Isaiah 40 says this. Do you not know? That's why it's important to know. It's important to know. It is important to know. Amen. Have you not heard? The Lord, let me introduce you to this God. In case you don't know this God, Isaiah is trying to say something. He said, but when you know God, it changes everything. He is what? An everlasting God. Do you know that everlasting God? He's the creator of the ends of the earth. Do you know that? He will not grow weary, tired, tired or weary. Do you understand that? His understanding is no one can fathom. Do you get that? If you know that, then you understand that he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. How do you know that? They will run and not be weary because when you know this everlasting God, when you know this God as a creator, when you know that this God does not get weary, when you know that this God does not sleep or, or slumber. When you understand that, then you can never say God has forgotten you. He said, now Israel says in Isaiah, God has forgotten me. My God has forgotten me. He said, how? You cannot say God has forgotten you because when you know God, he said, look, I have written you on the palm of my hands and my walls are ever before you. How can I forget you? God cannot forget you. If you know that God, he cannot forget you. He's faithful. You know, this morning, Theo, I was listening to the song we normally sing. Theo theologically, it's not correct, but I like it. But we'll, we'll keep singing it. When we sing, be magnified, we talk about there's nothing that you cannot do. That's not true. There are things that God cannot do. God cannot deny himself. He can't do that. He cannot lie. There are some things God cannot do. He cannot go against his promises. Anyway, let's leave it like that. Don't change it. Let's keep singing Number five, I want to write it down, prosperity. I'm, I, I'm almost done. Six, okay, prosperity. Why do we have to know God? Because when we know God, he will prosper us. Sometimes we're running after the things. When we realize, no, 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 we'll run after God. And the things will come. When we get focused on the things, we get everything upside down. Watch this. Let me, let, let me show you in first, Second Peter. It's a grace. Grace means favor. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. How does that come? Through knowledge of God. That's how favor comes. That's how peace comes. That's how prosperity comes. It comes through revelation, through knowledge and of Jesus Christ our Lord. He said his divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life. How did it come through? Through what? Knowledge, no God, and everything else will follow. Anyway, I, I need to finish. We need to get ready for the second service. Let me give you the final one. Number seven, paradise. Why do we need to know God? More than everything else I've talked to you, 
heaven. This is what Jesus said in John. Now, this is very important. If you've forgotten everything I've said here today, don't forget this. He said, this is the way to have eternal life. How do we do that? To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to us. Yeah, this is critical. It is critical. And some of you are here this morning. I'm telling you, if you don't know God, you cannot spend eternity with him. Do you know him? And I'm not asking you to play games. Do you really know him? If you don't know him in the next minute or two, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and surrender your life to him. Because it means eternal life. Yeah. You say, but pastor, um, in about 40, 50 years, most of us are not going to be alive. Where you spend eternity will determine how you know God. This means eternal life. They know in you the only true God. What have I said today? Seven things. You can't know God praise. You can't know the God. You can't worship the God that you don't know. You can only praise God, the God that you know. Number two, when you know God, it changes your priorities. When you know God, he brings you purpose. Number four, he brings you what? Purity. He gives you power, strength to live, prosperity and paradise. I want you to stand up on your feet this morning. I want to pray with you. Everybody start begin to pray. Say, God, just pray a simple prayer. Lord, I want to know you. Paul said, I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you know God better. Begin to pray and say, God, I want to know you better. I want to know you better.